Good morning. I'm Andrew Skada, and I'm one of our pastors here. And I want to welcome you to worship with us this morning at Trinity Presbyterian Church. Those of you who are worshiping with us in Williams Hall this morning, and also those of you who are worshiping with us online. Please take a moment, if you're worshiping in Williams Hall, to grab your friendship register. It's on the row in the middle aisle here, and pass that along. Put your name in, let us know that you're worshiping with us, and take a look and see who's worshiping with you as well. And for those of you who are worshiping with us online, please go ahead and head to our website where there is a link for you to fill out our, our worship registry. We're so glad that you are with us. Following worship this morning, we will be having refreshments, cookies, and water and lemonade right outside of Williams Hall, uh, porch on the punch on the porch. Um, but we're so glad to have you with us to worship and to share in fellowship. Thank you for joining us in this temporary but really awesome remodeled space um, as our sanctuary is currently being redone. Renovations include new carpeting, paint, uh, pew refurbishments, AV upgrades, which we are really looking forward to. And we should be back in there sometime around November. At this time, I would like you to take a moment and greet those who are around you with the peace of Christ. We are so glad that we can uh, greet and say hello to one another, and we are so glad that our time of conversation doesn't end. We will have more time for conversation uh, following this service. A couple of more announcements for us. Choir registration is open. There's a place for you and your family in the 2022 and 23 Trinity Choir Program. Registration is open for all singing and ringing choirs, ages four through adult, although if you're an adult, you may have to work with a particular music director um, who is actually fantastic. I told him I'd make a joke about him this morning. So you can go to Trinity's website to get involved in our music program and all the wonderful things going on with it. A handful of Trinity women, including several members of staff, they return today from the Women's Connection Retreat, which is in Montreat. We look forward to hearing about all that they have learned, their time, and we invite you to hold them in prayer as they make their way back home this morning. In the life of our family ministries, we have a lot going on, and two special events coming up. Next Sunday, August 21st, is our fourth and fifth grade pool party. And the following Sunday is August 28th, as we're calling it our church family kickoff, hosted by our family ministries, but everyone is invited to be a part of that. It's an intergenerational time to celebrate coming back together after summer and the kickoff of the school, school year. You can see your bulletin insert for more information on both of those events. Trinity's All Church kickoff is just around the corner on September 11th. You can see your bulletin and the Life at Trinity insert to learn more about that and many other upcoming events planned this fall, including more opportunities to meet Rebecca Lamon, our new senior pastor. The beautiful flowers in Williams Hall are given today by Sissy Smith to the glory of God and loving memory of her parents, Lucille M. and Sidney I. Smith. 
We also must announce that in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life, we share with you the news of the death of Trinity member Virginia Sandage Williams. A memorial service will be held tomorrow, Monday, August 15th at 4 p.m. in Dobbs Chapel with a reception to follow here in Williams Hall. We extend our deepest sympathy and prayers to Virginia's family. Let us take a moment now to offer our prayers together. For all those who are able, let us now stand and join in our call to worship. By faith, Abraham was called righteous when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance. He obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Loving, Loving God, God, give us faith like Abraham. Abraham that we might put our trust in you. Together, let us worship the God of Abraham. Amen. you to remain standing and join me in our prayer of confession this morning. Gracious and loving God, we confess that despite your presence with us, we are reluctant to go forward in faith. 
We often want control and disregard the truth that by faith in Jesus all things are possible. We're afraid to walk with you because we feel doubt, fear, and timidity. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for our sin. Renew within us an awareness that you are with us. May our renewed awareness of you make it possible to go where you want us to go, to do what you want us to do, and to give your name glory. We pray then, Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In, in Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Today's reading comes from Psalm 80, verses 1 through 2 and 8 through 19. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. You who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. Stir up your might and come to save us. You, bought, you brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it and all that move in the field feed on it. Turn again, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted. It has been burned with fire. It has been cut down. May they perish at the rebuke of your countenance. But let your hand be upon the one at your right hand, the one whom you made strong for yourself. Then we will never turn back from you. Give us life and we will call on your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Our second reading comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 29 through 12 to listen carefully for God's word. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days by faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouth of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. 
Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commanded, commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised. Since God had provided something better so that they would not apart from us be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. Holy God, as we hear the words, the words written long, long ago, may they speak to us. May you now speak through me that words commissioned by your spirit, that they might transform our hearts and minds so that we may live more faithfully in this world. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Derek Redmond was a British Olympic sprinter. He represented the United Kingdom in the 1992 Olympics. He was a world champion in the 400, in the 4 by 400, and a silver medalist in the world championships in the 4 by 400 another year. He held the record as the fastest 400 meter sprinter in the country. He had trained his entire life to make it to the 1992 Olympics. He wanted nothing more than to win Olympic gold. Derek trained immensely hard and was ready for these Olympic games. In the very first heat, he set the fastest pace of any sprinter. In the quarterfinals, he easily won his heat. And then in the semifinals, he was leading. And halfway through the race, he stopped. And he grabbed his leg in agony, and he almost fell to the floor. He was in immense pain, and it was obvious that there's no way he would be able to finish. The cameras saw him, and then all of a sudden they panned into the stands, and there was a man who was running down, and the man was barreling through all barricades, disregarding all signs, going past security, and he even hopped the fence ran around people trying to stop him to run over to Derek. The man ran over to Derek, and he helped Derek up. And when helping him up, he threw his arm around his shoulder. He put his other arm around his waist, and they began to make their way towards the finish line. They walked. They kind of hobbled. And eventually, they crossed. And when they crossed, there was a standing ovation from the crowd. That person was his father. He went through all of these barricades and everything to get to his son who was struggling to help him up and walk across that finish line. It's a wonderful, wonderful scene. It's a fantastic video, video that you can now go and watch on YouTube, and I encourage you to do that. Not right now, but after the service. It's quite moving and powerful, enough so that that video was used by the Olympic Committee to talk about the goodness that happens within sports. When we preach and often read Hebrews, we think of Hebrews 12, particularly 12, 1 through 2, the ending of the verses that I just read. 
We often talk about races, the race we're on in this life, the race of faith, and the cloud of witnesses that support us in this life of our faith as we seek to run well, to finish strong in the race that God has marked out for us. And races are often great analogies for life and also for faith. Hebrews 12.1, in fact, was the very first Bible verse that I ever fully committed to memory in the NIV version. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. I got a lot of Bible bucks for remembering that. Miss Henry and Miss Hispaniac, they would be so proud of me this day. <laughs> this text is moving, especially when you say it amongst your cloud of witnesses. And we quickly realize the importance of having faith together as a community and ultimately how we need each other. And that's all fine and well, and it will have its place in this sermon. But today, Hebrews 12.1 isn't going to be the main focus. It's going to be everything before and the struggle that the author of Hebrews tells us about in chapter 11. We're going to talk about struggle, the training, the sacrifice, and the giving up of things in order to run the race, let alone even come close to finishing it. Much like the struggle that Derek Redman had, Derek had to prepare he had to train right, eat right, sleep right, recover right. He had to get rid of the distractions in his life so that he could focus on preparing and struggling for this race. He had to do everything right to be the best that he could be. And he did all of this with every intention of winning, but was ultimately met with disappointment. Not being able to finish the race and to accomplish his dreams the race that Derek ran and the races that we will run, they all have a cost. But we run them because we believe the cost is worth it. Part faith we are so often taught. Part of the cost is that agony and suffering and training doesn't always end in glory. More often than not, it doesn't. And sometimes it ends in the same agony we experience in preparation. Like the Olympic runner seeing idols and inspirations before him, the author of Hebrews tells the story of triumph. By faith, the people of God passed through the Red Sea and their Egyptian enslavers, they were stopped. By faith, the walls of Jericho, they came crashing down. By faith, Rahab was spared. And then Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel, and the prophets, and those before them conquered kingdoms and were mighty in war. Yet we hear right after about all of those who were not so lucky. The ones who ran the race only to suffer we hear about suffering pain. We hear about suffering disappointment and even death, the author of Hebrews tells us. And I know we're not starting this sermon out on a very positive or what seems like helpful ideas, but I think that's also the point. Faith, we are so often taught, is a faith of what I like to call rainbows and unicorns and prosperity if you do it right. But that's not actually the story of Scripture. It's not the narrative of the Old Testament. It's not the story of Paul in prison or of Stephen or of Peter or of so many other characters in our texts. It's not the story of Christ's death on the cross or the story of so many who seek to follow Jesus around our world today. The reality is that rainbows, unicorns, and personal satisfaction have little, if anything, to do with our historic Christian faith. Prosperity and ease has little to nothing to do with following Jesus. In fact, Paul tells us that we will likely suffer for our faith, that following Jesus will be challenging. Living 
by faith is never and has never been about aesthetic or material beauty and glory, but about the beauty of death and resurrection, of struggle that is met with hope, of despair that is met with joy, of a long, long, tiring, and sometimes disappointing race met with the cloud of witnesses, barging through barriers, ignoring warning signs, jumping over the fence just to join one another on this ultra marathon race that we call faith. And in this race, there is no winner. This is the race of faith that we were on together. Faith is something that is costly. It costs us sometimes our jobs and our friendships. It costs us influence and opportunities because why would you not take this or that job even though you feel God calling you somewhere else? Sometimes it even costs us money Historically, being a person of faith has cost people their lives, from martyrs of the early church all the way to the Holocaust, and even now today, although we don't hear about them much, and thank goodness. But following in the ways of Jesus, it costs us in different ways. It costs us in material ways, in relational ways. When we follow in the ways of Jesus, we have to constantly seek to live differently. And yes, there are laws in our country and in this world that we follow, but we don't live by the codes of modern society, but by the code of loving God first and neighbor second, even before ourselves. And yet there are still many Christians within our tradition who would disagree about how to do this. Faith costs people politically. It costs people relationships. It costs people jobs. It costs people one more number or comma on their annual salary or in their portfolio because the life of faith requires a turn towards God and a turn towards other, not a turn towards more of this thing or that thing or social status or your place on the org chart. Sometimes faith even costs us our dreams. Diedrich Bonhoeffer and his contemporary Karl Barth felt this firsthand. They were exiled from Germany during World War II. Bonhoeffer was eventually imprisoned and ultimately killed. And it is true that his attempt to kill Hitler and overthrow the Nazi party had questionable moral foundations. What is not questionable is that his insistence on supporting the confessing church, opposing the Nazis, that it costs him everything. On November 10th, Brian Stevenson will come to Trinity. He will speak at our annual Cottrell Lectures. We will hear of his struggle of growing up in segregated Delaware, the struggle he and others have gone through seeking justice for those wrongly accused and sitting on death row only to continue in their struggle again and again and again. The reality is that in life and in faith, if there was no struggle, there'd be no impetus for us to live differently, to live well, to live after the ways of Jesus, because the silver faith platter would not only be too easy, but undesirable for it wouldn't actually lead to any justice or any mercy or walking humbly with God. Stevenson said in his book, Just Mercy, that there is strength, a power even, in understanding brokenness because embracing our brokenness creates a need and desire for mercy and perhaps a corresponding need to show mercy. It's in our DNA to struggle to do work. It's in our God-given design from the, from the garden to toil and to be stewards of the land even when the harvest is really, really light. Faith, I like to describe sometimes, is like the game of golf. Now, I can hit the ball quite far. And if I look around the room, I think there are some people who have seen me do that. They are witnesses. <laughs> but to get the ball on the green and in the hole is a struggle after struggle after struggle. Yet I keep playing because the joy doesn't come from simply achieving something. 
It comes from the struggle. It comes from doing. It comes from doing so in community, from failing and the commitment to doing it again and again, regardless of the outcome. Playing golf costs me my ego. (laughs) Our faith costs us our egos too. Faith isn't about accomplishment, but about fidelity. Fidelity to the God who is eternally faithful, to the call to care for the least of these, to love the neighbor as ourself, to seek justice in the world, to love kindness, to walk humbly, and to do so expecting no wins, no glory, no compensation, no remittance, and to consider it all pure joy, my brothers and sisters. From the Israelites to Jesus and Paul, there was wandering in the wilderness, looking for a home and food to eat, flogging, mocking, torture, death by the sword and death by the cross. The imperfections of the life of faith abound, yet we are still told that by faith we can move mountains and more. That is because there is Hebrews 11, where we hear about the cost of following in the ways of God. But there is still Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. I've told this story before. You may have heard it. But it's just too fitting to not tell again. Uh, It was the summer of 2009. And I went with two friends. And we went hiking in uh, Banff in Canada. All the way through up to Assiniboine Provincial Park. And we made a 53-mile loop that we did in too little of days. It was a challenge. Uh, On our first day, we had some setbacks. We were supposed to go to our normal campsite, but the road to that was closed, so we had to camp a little farther away, which extended our very first day of backpacking. We went on this day. We ended up doing 21 miles in our very first day. We were exhausted. We were tired. It started snowing on us, even in September, I know. It got a little cold. It was a little bit wet. And we got to the main pass that we had to go over. And when we were going, ready to go up the pass, we saw a sign that said, bears, no entry. And we thought, great. But there was a detour, so we hiked a couple miles to an even steeper pass that we had to go on to get into Assiniboine Provincial Park. And as we went up, that very, very, very steep mountain, my hip flexors in both my legs began to give out. I was in good shape, but I was not ready to hike up such a steep mountain and to do it for so long. I would have to take breaks. I would hop and I would sit down and I would say, hey, just give me a couple of minutes, let my legs relax, and then I would get up and I would go again. Eventually, I started having to grab my hiking pants and I would use each arm to pull them up like a ventriloquist to get myself to continue to go. I sat down and I was exhausted both mentally and physically and I got up for for this next go and we were getting so close to the top and I knew it and I just kept going. I just kept struggling up this hill until we made the top and then I could slowly make my way down. But what I didn't realize is that on that last part, the reason why I was able to keep going is because Jim and Nate each had their hands on the back of my backpack and were pushing me up the hill. When we are the cloud of witnesses joining in the struggle of the race or the hike or whatever it is we are on, we represent the truth that in our text, it is Christ who perfects us and our faith. We don't own it. It is not ours to weaponize or consume. It is lacking and in need of God's grace so that our fidelity to faith in Christ might become a little bit more like Christ's faith and fidelity to God, to die on the cross so that we might have life. If the life of Jesus can tell us anything, it is that there is no resurrection without death, but there is friends' resurrection. 
The life of faith we live and lead will not be pretty. It will not be easy. It won't be satisfactory or accomplished. It will be started and we won't ever finish it in this life. But this challenging life of faith with the communion of saints all the way from the saints of history to the saints here right now can be unbelievably beautiful. And it's beautiful because its cost is the giving up of ourselves as isolated individuals in and for ourselves for the sake of the cloud of witnesses, modeling the perfecting of our faith accomplished only in Jesus Christ. The life of faith will be costly, but its beauty is that we do it together. And in doing it together, we inch closer to following in the ways of Jesus Christ, the God who for us and our salvation, it costs absolutely everything. Amen. Please stand now and join me as we affirm our faith together. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere, giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of peoples long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, come, Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. seated. Please join your hearts with me in prayer. God of the wind and the sea and the storm, so many of your children are weathering the storms of life today, and we lift them up to you now. We pray for those who are suffering the effects of real storms for those who have lost their homes and livelihoods due to the flooding in Kentucky and Montana. We pray for your strength to comfort them. For those who are living in fear of wildfires that are quickly spreading out west, we pray for rain. For our friends who are living on the street, that they may be safe in this extreme heat. We pray for those who are struggling through personal storms. We lift up those who are doubting, those who are struggling with the everyday weight of depression and anxiety, those who long for someone to reach out their hand and pull them to safety. We pray that your love and compassion would surround each of them as they move through this turbulent world. We pray for our country, O oh Lord, for those in leadership and power that they would seek justice and peace in the decisions they make every day. We pray for our world leaders, that they would reach out in peace to one another, that you would guide them on a path to protect and serve your children. God, as we reach out our hand to you, crying, Lord, save us, we know that you have already reached out your hands to us. Hearing our prayers, and holding us close. 
And so with the boldness of those who can step out in faith, we pray all this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All that we are and all that we have comes from God. And each week in worship, we set aside this time to return God a portion of what we have received, rededicating our lives, our faith journeys, our God-given talents, and a portion of the resources that have been entrusted to us. So in this time, may we give with gratitude and joy.
God of the universe, our hearts overflow with thanksgiving to you. You are infinitely good to us. Help us to give freely and joyfully towards the work of your kingdom. We are blessed for the many diverse ways we can worship you through songs and hymns, prayers and praise, and through when, when we are your hands and feet to others in need. We worship you through our givings of our tithes and offerings with gratitude and joy. Accept these offerings today that we give for your immeasurable blessings. Amen. It is true that by faith we can move mountains, but it is also true that there is a cost to our faith and that there is struggle, but we have the joy of doing it within community, of being a cloud of witnesses, and if you are in need of a cloud of witnesses, there is one that is here for you to help you along the way. So let us now go from this place knowing that the Spirit of God is with us, encouraging us and cheering us on as we seek to shine light in all of the dark places. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. 